It's actually an incredibly important part of life in general. If you want something to happen, you better visualize it happening. That sounds all new agey, but it really isn't. You need to have a plan and have a plan to make that plan work. Just hoping that something's going to work. Yeah, it doesn't really work that way. This is Task, Time, Energy, the Purpose-Filled Productivity Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Miller. Welcome to the show. Welcome, everyone. Our guest today is Kate Cooper Jensen. And Kate started skydiving in 1978. And I would say probably quickly grew to love the sport. Would that be accurate, Kate? It would be very accurate. Actually, actually semi-accurate. I was definitely into it, but wasn't quite sure. And what I decided is to, I would make a hundred jumps because I figured that it's I, you know, one jump, two jumps, static lines isn't enough to experience the sport. But if I did a hundred jumps, then I would actually have a good bite of it. And then if I wanted to leave, it'd be okay. Now, spoiler alert, I was gone long before I made a hundred jumps, but I did decide to make a hundred jumps. Wow. That's an interesting way to get started. So Kate, you are a world record holder. You are a competitor, a coach, an organizer. Um, I've been a professional in the sport for quite a few years. In 1983, you created Square One with Tony Domenico, which is a parachute equipment dealer for any of our listeners who are not Scott Ivers and not familiar. In 1997, you helped found Jump for the Cause, a nonprofit that organized women's formation skydiving world record attempts to raise money for breast cancer charities. I've read that the group set four FAI women's world records for the largest formation skydive. And again, for our non skydiving listeners, FAI is the International Air Sports Association. And I read that Jump for the Cause uh, has raised more than $1.9 million for breast cancer charities. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, um, a, a legacy of mine that I am forever proud of. Yeah, I can imagine. That's, that's, a, that's a pretty amazing accomplishment. You've been inducted into the Skydiving Hall of Fame. You have participated in numerous movies, television shows, commercials, and as as again, our, our non skydiving listeners might not be aware, the current formation skydiving world record is four hundred people, and that was set back in two thousand and six, and it still stands. So, if, if you've ever seen the the big formations, the big snowflake looking formations where you have all these skydivers holding on to each other, that's what we're talking about when we talk about formation skydiving and formation skydiving records. And again. 400 people. If you haven't seen this or seen a picture, I would say go Google it. Listen to the rest of the podcast first, but then go Google it. <laughs> um, it's pretty impressive just to look at the size of the formation. Kate, you said you're currently doing a lot of traveling and doing some skydiving in exotic locations and, and organizing in, in different interesting locations. You said you have about 16,000 skydives. Mm -hmm. I'll say that number again for, for non-skydivers <laughs> who just went, what? Yeah, 16,000 skydives. Is there anything else you want to share about what you've been doing recently? Maybe some of your other adventures or accomplishments? Well, I mean, that's, that's a good sum. Um, we can add to the world record list because just this past weekend, I was part of a team and part of the organization team for SOS, which stands for Skydivers Over 60, and that's 60 years old. And we had 101 skydivers over the age of 60 years old from about 14 different countries, and we built a world record for the largest formation, which is 101 persons linked together in free fall. We did that on Saturday after our fourth attempt only at it. And then Sunday, we followed up that hat trick with a uh, using 95 people. Some people had to leave early, two separate formations on the same skydive. So it's a 2.95 way, and that in, a, in and of itself was a second world record. So we had a very, very busy and fruitful weekend with, you know, there's been Good Morning America, there's been uh, LA, there's been all kinds of new stuff. They keep calling us seniors. Who who are these people? <laughs> I know, they feel like we're seniors. It's one of the beauties of any sport, our sport, but I think this goes for any sport, is you stay young if you stay active. 
And I'll tell you what, this group of SOS jumpers from all over the world and, and went up to over 80 years old. It wasn't just all 60, 61, 62 are in great shape, great shape, mentally, physically, the whole lot. And we had a very safe weekend, zero malfunctions. When I say malfunction, that's when your main parachute doesn't open correctly. You have to go to your reserve canopy. 101 people, 11 jumps, zero malfunctions. And Scott will tell you that is well outside the norm for skydiving in general. Just shows you how safe the group was and how well they took care of their equipment and skydiving. Yeah, excellent. Which is, of course, always a, a high priority on these, you know, these world record formation skydives. You know, again, we're talking about a hundred people or more jumping out of several different airplanes, flying up to one another, linking on, holding on to each other in free fall. You know, holding on to each other's arms and legs to make these beautiful snowflake formations. And when you talk about multiple points, we're talking about building one formation and then a bunch of people will move around to build a completely different shape in the sky. And you're all doing this on one single jump in the course of maybe 60 to 90 seconds to do all this. Absolutely correct. I'm very excited about it. So as we talk about you know, formation skydiving, I was wondering if you would be willing to talk people through a formation skydive, like what is actually like first person to be there in the air. So maybe you're building something, you know, with a hundred people or more and you're in the airplane and you take off and there are going to be these, you know, several airplanes flying close together in formation and you're going to jump out of them. But, you know, would you be willing to do that, Kate? Could you like talk us through first person? Of course. Let me see if I can make, hopefully this will make sense to your uh, listeners, but well, first and foremost, we have to have a plan. And the plan is down on paper in an app on a computer, and it shows all the little people doing their formations. You couldn't see that because you're talking, but I just did a little thing with my hands. And we then assign people to specific slots. And one of the things when we're doing a record is if I say that Scott needs to be 16th out of the second left trail aircraft and dock on Kate's right leg, then that's what has to happen. You can't dock on Kate's left leg because it's not a record. You have to dock on Kate's right leg. So what we do is we call it a dirt dive. And a dirt dive is when we take, in this case, the 101 participants that we had last weekend, they all know what their exit slot from the aircraft is. They all know what their radio through the center of the formation is, their quadrant, and they know who they're docking on beside and, if necessary, who is docking on them. We set up in our relative aircraft on the ground. Again, this is a dirt dive, and we walk out to the center of a field and build the formation as it will look in free fall. Now, in free fall, obviously, we're on our bellies because we're free falling. When we're doing the dirt dive, we're actually walking, but we bend over a bit to give some sort of shape and structure. And if I have um, Martin's right leg in my left hand, I wait until Martin is docked. And then I take a deep breath, calm myself down, make sure my body has stopped move, moving so that the last movement is my the actual physical picking up of the grip. Now reach forward with my left hand, pick up Martin's leg, and then I am rock solid still so that other people in turn can build on me. Next part of the uh, dirt dive, we not only have to get there, but even more important, we have to get away because we have to open our parachutes. Very important part of any skydive. So at a preset altitude, in this case, it was 7,000 feet above ground level, um, we have little devices in our helmets that go beep, 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 beep. And we track away. Track is the body position that allows us to move horizontal relative to the formation. We're still falling, mind you, falling at 120 miles an hour. But we can move horizontally aware, away so that we get distance from our each other all across the sky and then can safely deploy our canopies, open our parachutes, and then fly to the landing area. So this is the dirt dive. We've, we haven't gotten to the skydive yet. This is the <laughs> dirt dive. So we do this until everybody knows where they're going, what the plan is, when they can leave, where they land, yada, yada, yada. Then we get ready to go. We put on our parachutes. We put on our jumpsuits. We get our helmets ready. 
We do gear checks. We always want to make sure that the equipment is correct. Any sport you're in, you should be checking your gear on a regular basis. I don't care what sport it is. Sometimes we check each other. Then we have to go to the aircraft. So you need to make sure you get on the right aircraft. Uh, again, it's not it's not as hard as it sounds, but you'd be surprised that people get onto the wrong or at least start walking towards the wrong aircraft. And I want to pause for a second, Kate, and, and just let people know part of the reason why this is so important. You know, Kate's describing this very careful planning. I mean, I can remember when I was working um, working at Performance Designs, Rags Rajanti would do some of these plans in AutoCAD. So this is, you know, you'll you'll somebody will plan out what this formation is going to look like, and then you'll create a ca- very careful like blueprint for it. Basically, like I said, this has been done in AutoCAD, where every single skydiver has a very specific place to be, and part of the reason why it's so specific and you can't just go out there and do whatever you want is because, like, if you're doing a world record attempt, it has to be the exact formation that was planned and declared on the ground before you go up. So then, you know, Kate, you've been describing this whole process where before you even get in the airplane, you're, you know, multiple times going to set everything up on the ground and walk through the entire sky dive. Like you say, a dirt dive is what we call it. And very carefully plan and walk through and rehearse every single part, including the part where everyone flies away from each other and gets into clean air, you know, to open your parachutes. And then you got to go and get on the airplane. So I'm going to let you pick it back up from there. Okay. So now we get to go get do the fun part. We all know where we're going. We know how we're going to get there. We have a plan. We've visualized. And visualization is an incredibly important part of any sport. It's actually an incredibly important part of life in general. If you want something to happen, you better visualize it happening. That sounds all new agey, but it really isn't. You need to have a plan And have a plan to make that plan work. Just hoping that something's going to work. Yeah, it doesn't really work that way. You need a plan. You need to have an objective plan. If if your goal is to get out of bed in the morning and brush your teeth, you need to have a plan to get out of bed, walk around the bed, and brush your teeth. Um, This is something any parent knows that they have to teach their children (laughs) how to do this. After a while, you visualize something, it becomes a habit. You don't have to worry so much about it, like brushing the teeth is a habit, but we need to practice. We need to plan. So we're visualizing our skydive from getting up in the airplane to deploying our canopy multiple times. We only have about 65, 70 seconds to do in free fall, but we can have that 65, 70 seconds in our brain as many times as we want and as many times as we need until that visualization approaches reality. And it's an incredibly important tool for life in general, but for any sport, um, skydiving specific. So anyway, so there we are, back to the aircraft. I'm going to go back again to last weekend's jump. We had 101 people. We were using five different aircraft. The five aircraft were uh, five sky vans, which is a tailgate aircraft where we run out of the back of the airplane. Whee! And one twin otter, which is a side door aircraft where we get to hang outside the airplane and jump out the side. We I was in the I was in the otter, which is actually kind of cool because you have much better visibility out the window. Mm -hmm. So we have to get on the right airplane. We have to get in the airplane in the right order. We can't just all jam on there like a subway in Japan with somebody stuffing the last people in there because (laughs) we have to unwrap it when we get to altitude. So the last person out of the airplane gets on the airplane first. Believe it or not, that is actually the one of the most difficult things to get skydivers to do right. (laughs) Bloody airplane in the right order. You'd think there would be other things that would be more challenging, but no. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, Scott, yeah, you you appreciate this, I think. I am. And I want to, again, explain for, for or some of our listeners who don't skydive. Part of the reason why this is so important is because the airplanes that we're using are, are kind of small. They're, I think, what you know the normal population would call a puddle jumper. It's a little small like cargo or commuter airplane that holds maybe 20, 24 people. Getting everybody on the airplane correctly so that you can all get out in the right place is, is yeah, it's important. So please, Kate, carry on. Herding cats. Perfect analogy for (laughs) skydiving, but and again, for life in general. So we get everybody on the airplane in the right order, sitting down, we take off. We have videographers. A videographer is a skydiver with a parachute, the whole thing, but they have on their head, on their helmet, a vast array of very expensive and fancy video equipment and cameras. 
And without these wonderful people, we wouldn't have proof. So the videographer gets on the airplane as well. Um, usually he's one of the first people out. So he's one of the last ones on. I, I'm using he as generic because women can be videographers as well. So there we are. We're climbing to altitude. In this case, our altitude was 16,500 feet above ground level. Now that has its own little tweaks because above 12,500 feet, uh, you need supplemental oxygen. That is a is not only a good idea, it is actually the rules. So we have an oxygen bottle in the aircraft with tubes down and everybody has a nasal cannula. Think of any hospital scene on any TV show, show you've ever seen. It's that little plastic thing that goes in, in the nose of the person who's dying on the bed. Well, we use them for fun. We're not dying. Um, so at about 12,500 feet, we turn on the oxygen and we have a little flow of trickle flow. It's not incredibly high, but a flow of oxygen to keep our blood oxygen levels to what would be normal on the ground, 98, 99% saturation, even at 16,500 feet. We do not jump with the oxygen, but we're falling so fast that we're back into highly oxygenated air before there are any issues. We're also wearing full face helmets, kind of like motorcycle helmets. And the helmet itself is filled with oxygen by way of the nasal cannula before we exit. So it's kind of having your own little oxygen mask for the first few seconds out. So there we are. We're in formation, which means the airplanes are flying in kind of a V patterns. I think geese. And the base or center of the formation comes out of the lead goose. It kind of gets pooped out. And then that's the symbol or signal, excuse me, for the rest of us to jump out of our aircraft. And then once we exit, we present, identify, and intercept. Those three words are specific to skydiving, but again, they're, they're kind of work for life as well. Present means we have to get out and have a good exit. We're presenting ourselves to the relative win, or if you want to say uh, into a day-to-day -day thing, you're presenting yourself to the morning, to the what's going on the rest of the day. Then we identify. As we're presenting, I identify where the base is. So you get, a, get up in the morning, you present yourself, then you identify what your goals for the day are. It might be brushing the teeth might be a PhD dissertation. It's probably somewhere in between. So, and then third, you intercept. And the term intercept we use instead of go to because everything's in motion. The airplanes are flying forward at about 85, 90 knots, roughly hundred miles an hour. And everything's in motion. And obviously we're falling down at about, eventually about 120 miles an hour. So when I say intercept, I, my slot, I want to see not where it is when I exit, but where it's going to be because everything's moving. And again, on a day-to-day -day or life thing is your, your targets, your goals, they're rarely static. They're usually moving. So uh, be, be aware of that. It's your... If whatever your goal is, it's, it's going to slide around on you a bit. So you have to keep your eye on it. You have to be ready to intercept it. If it does a 90 right, you've got to be there to do a 90 right on that as well. Then as we come through the formation, it's building larger and larger and larger from the center out. Uh, Scott already described it as a snowflake, very apt description. And everybody has a specific place to be in the formation, whether it's picking up a leg, picking up a hand, being sideways, even being out facing or backing in. We can have all sorts of different maneuverables, anything you can imagine you could do with a couple of Ken and Barbie dolls. No, not that, but any, anything else you could do with a couple of Ken and Barbie dolls, you could you can imagine if you had a hundred of them, you could build a pretty cool skydive. Then uh, we're in the formation. And I'll tell you what, when a formation is complete, it's electric. You can feel it's, uh, we use noise terms, audible terms a lot, um, where something is noisy means there's a lot of movement, a lot of tension. It takes a lot of work to stay in the formation. If a formation is quiet, it's flat. Everybody's falling the same fall rate. Everybody's in a neutral body position. You use zero tension and you can tell when it's complete because it's flat, it's quiet, it's flying well. Both completions this weekend, I had no question in my mind as I was tracking off, flying away from the formation that we had completed a world record. It, it's that obvious when it's quiet and flying well. 
Then of course we have to deploy our canopies, 101 parachutes in the air now. We have designated landing areas because one tiny little landing, two cool landing area where all the cameras are can get pretty uh, pretty messy if 101 people try to land there. So we have designated landing areas across the field, either walk back or take a pickup truck back or something, and then get to watch the video. Again, yay, videographers, and see the proof of what we, what we already knew we had just done. We amassed the entire team together on the ground and show the video. And we do this over and over for fun. <laughs> That was amazing, Kate. Yeah, that's like a great walkthrough from start to finish. And and hopefully, you know, some people who are listening are able to like, just enjoy that story and be right there with you. One of the reasons why I was excited about having you on the podcast and doing an episode like this is because with the coaching work that I do, I coach executives, I coach managers, other leaders, I coach students, I coach entrepreneurs. And a lot of the coaching I do is helping people who want to improve their time management skills. Or, you know, like I said, what I enjoy doing is helping people feel more satisfied with the way they use their time. And I think there are so many great analogies between skydiving, so many great lessons from skydiving that apply to this, right? Apply to people's everyday lives. So, you know, just to kind of play that back a little bit and and, and maybe highlight some of those lessons, you talked about the planning. And I think this is something that can be very important for people is if you're not happy with how you're spending your time or what you're getting done each day, let's look at the plan. You know, do you have a plan at all? And I think for different people, there are going to be different levels of planning that are required. Some people, it's going to be like planning a world record skydive where you're going to have very carefully orchestrated everything planned out. Um, Other people just need maybe a little bit of of a loose framework. And those three elements, the present, identify, intercept. So as you you know you start your day and you go into your plan, you're going to have a plan and yet you need to be ready for things to change. You can have a very carefully planned and orchestrated, orchestrated skydive, but no two skydives are the same. No two formation jumps are the same. It's always a little different. And there are little differences in how we exit the airplane and how, where that person in front of you is and where the person behind you is and next to you. So we're always constantly adjusting with the plan in mind and yet with the flexibility to say, oh, okay, this formation's falling a little slower than they normally do, or this one's going a little faster. So we need to adapt and adjust to that. And just being aware of what's going on in the moment, you know, like you said, some formations, I mean, if you can, you can picture... 100, 200, 400 people together in free fall, all falling, trying to fall together, trying to all fall in the same place. And yet there can be that tension you were talking about where literally it's almost like that that person's leg you're holding onto is is trying to be ripped out of your hand. So we're all constantly adjusting a little bit, right? Adjusting. We have our plan, but yet we have to adjust to the actual situation. And you talked about that electric feeling when a formation completes, right? When you know, okay, we know everybody's here. Everybody's in their spot where they're supposed to be. We got the record. The connection with other people. That's one of the things I always loved about skydiving is, yeah, like you're falling 120 miles an hour through the air and it's super exciting and you get that big burst of adrenaline. And yet the best part of it is just looking across a formation or looking next to you at like one of your best friends and the smile on that person's face, and you know that you're both thinking the exact same thing at the same time. So there's, you know, the the social connection too, and and the connection we have with other people can be so helpful in what we're trying to accomplish and make it so satisfying. We were talking about priorities, like on every skydive, the top priority is you have to open a parachute and you have to do that at a safe altitude above the ground. And in one of these large formations with a hundred other people, you have to get far enough away from those other people before you open your parachute so you're not opening your parachute in someone else's face. And so, you know, that that's always like there is always the priority. The top priority, you know, is safety on these on these on these jumps. So, and I think again, that's a parallel to what we encounter in our everyday lives where it's so important to know what our priorities are. I had a friend, a friend of mine, Graham Downey, we just recorded an episode with him, and he talked about a highlight, a daily highlight. Like there's one thing that he always wants to have planned every day, one thing that is like his top priority. And if at the end of the day, he did that one thing, he's going to be super happy. Yeah. Sometimes we feel so much pressure to do so many things. Like I have such a long to-do list. And yet when you start thinking in terms of priorities, what's the real priority here? What's really important? That kind of gives us some clarity, right? 
you talked about the debrief at the end. So we have these, these skydiving photographers, videographers going out there, videotaping the jump. And then when everyone lands, you'll go and, and watch. It's a debrief. So we look at that. We look at what happened and we learn from it. And then we celebrate, right? Like, you know, it's, 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 a be, it's amazing to be on the ground when a group accomplishes that dive that they wanted to do, that exact plan, especially if it's a world record, right? And you hear the big cheer go up when everybody sees it on the video. And it's just this roar of these, you know, hundred or more people who are super excited because they know they just got a world record. So celebrating, which I think is something that people often neglect, people get very focused on their goals and we get focused on what we haven't accomplished, right? Like, oh, well, I had these, you know, 10 things on my to-do list today and I only did five or whatever. And people really undervalue positive reinforcement and celebrating the wins, celebrating the You know, like even if you don't get the record, even if something, you know, doesn't come together perfectly in the air. And yet at the end of the day, you're sitting with your friend just going, man, I was so glad. I'm so glad to see you again. I'm so glad we got to do that jump together. Just celebrating the parts of it that were good. And records aren't easy. You don't get them more often than you do get them. Uh, Huge goals are not easy. Uh, It's the you look at any successful entrepreneur anywhere through the ages and their list of failures crashes, you know, bunks, losses, whatever, far, far outreach the success that they're known for, the successes they're known for, but they kept doing it. Yeah. I'm I'm curious in all your experiences, you know, again, world record holding skydiver, entrepreneur, started a successful business, um, started a successful nonprofit. I would love if you're willing to, for you to share some, maybe like a, a story of how that played out for you, kind of working through some adversity or or disappointment that eventually led to success. Is there a story you could share? Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, I've had far more failures than I have had successes uh, over and over and over again. I mean, the the school of hard knocks, learning learning to start a business with my my ex-partner. Not, had I known I was going to be running a, a huge multi-location pro shop, I probably would have looked at a business degree instead of a geology degree. But you know what? It's you, you, you learn, you learn on the fly and you make mistakes. Oh, Lordy, you make mistakes. If you're, if you're very lucky and we were, the mistakes do not sink you, but it's, you know, we we used to, a running joke was, you know, a dollar a day and we'd take a dollar out of our pocket and throw on the ground and go, okay, that's the dollar that we spent today. You know, <laughs> we didn't earn a dollar. We lost a dollar, but you, um, you slowly go through it. Yeah. I mean, you ask for a specific and nothing is coming to mind right now. Although the 10, somewhere probably around two o'clock in the morning this morning, I'll wake up and go, ah, I should have said that. But, uh, but there, there, there's just multiples uh, in, in the skydiving specific I'll go back again to the weekend that we just had, incredibly successful by any terms, 101 60-year-old skydivers from around the world. And this is ranging from women who are four foot five and 80 pounds to guys who are six foot seven. I mean, it's one of the really cool things about skydiving is size doesn't make a difference. Age doesn't make a difference. We use weight belts, we use jumpsuits, we have all kinds of different little tools to let us play together. But uh, we can all play together on an equal playing ground, men and women. It's one of the things that just totally I I adore about this sport. Um, Another sport of mine, scuba diving, very similar as well. It makes no, it doesn't make a difference what your age or physical size is. We can all play together. And that's something, I think it's something to remember in, in general life is you're only as good as what you can do. You're not as good as what other people can do. It's really easy to fall in the trap where if I would be better if only the pe- the other people around me did their job better. And then you're setting yourself up to be a victim of somebody else's success or failure. You really need to learn to succeed or fail all by yourself and realize that it's not tied into other people. I mean, obviously, sometimes things are inevitably tied in. But really coach yourself, teach yourself to stand on your own two feet and say, this is what I could have done better. And it's not a case of what other people around you 
how that would affect it. Now, if you do better, the people around you will probably do better as well by definition. And if everybody's got that goal, you have a functional team. If everybody's sitting around there saying, well, I would, you know, if Joe would get his act together, then I could do my job. <laughs> you have a dysfunctional team. And, and back again to last year, we did the exact same event. Uh, skydivers over 60, 100 jumpers. We did not succeed. Jump after jump after jump, one person out, two people out. When I say out, it means they did not physically get into the formation in time or they were in the incorrect position or incorrect slot. For the entire five days, we had zero completions. We had great jumps. We had safe jumps. 99.9% did their job every time. And it's really easy to go like, well, if only that person would get their act, you know, get their acting gear. But then it's you next time because you're um, complacent. I'm doing my job. I'm doing my job until whoops, you're not doing your job because you went on to autopilot. You didn't give the it didn't give it the energy, the visualization, uh, the focus that was required. And all of a sudden you're the one that makes the mistake. So if, if you if you set up to do a job, to have a goal of anything, don't get complacent and worry about your part of the puzzle. And if you can, you can coach other people into theirs. This is what this is what I do is to help people realize their potential by improving small mistakes so they can be better skydivers. But all this can translate into just general life as well. So I didn't answer your question at all, but no, you did. There were some really excellent, I think, excellent points in there. One thing you pointed out that I think is really important is, I mean, we are we we all depend on other people, right? And we all, you know, I think I think most of us, in one time or another, end up in a situation where we want to contribute to a team and be a good team member. You know, no individual single skydiver can create a 101 way world record formation all by themselves. You need a hundred other friends to do that with. You need a team. And yet you talked about individual responsibility, right? And the importance of taking responsibility for yourself, for your own actions, for your own performance, because it is so easy for us to blame other people. Like you said, we get concerned about what other people are doing rather than looking at ourselves or blame circumstances, right? Like, oh, the world isn't fair, or you know, my job is this, or my you know, home is that. Taking responsibility for ourselves allows us to be good team players and good teammates. There was something else that just stood out there is you know, you're talking about how there's no guarantees on any skydive. You can do your job perfectly, and yet one person was not in their position where they were supposed to be. They didn't take the right grip on the right person. And so now it's not a, a record. And that happens more often than, than not. Mm -hmm. So having the resilience to just pack up and go do it again, or to like you, you know, showed up at this event this weekend where the year before you didn't get the record and you're going to show up again. And it's going to be a lot of the same, mostly the same group of people probably. And just having that willingness to say, okay, this is a new day, this today. And I think this is another thing that ties into, you know, how we, we live our lives is a lot of people, um, it's easy to hang on to the past and what happened an hour ago or yesterday or a year ago, instead of saying, all right, this is now, and this is a whole new opportunity. And let's just focus on what's happening now. So I don't know if any of that really made sense or connected to what you were talking about, but. One of the sayings is you're only as good as your next jump. <laughs> You're only as good as your next jump. Yeah. 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 Um, one other thing that you mentioned that I think is really helpful to talk about is the new agey stuff, right? You were talking about visualization. And it's interesting, you know, over the years, even like recently, people talk about visualization, meditation, mindfulness, and all these things. I've been interested in that for a while and and you know, studying meditation. And as I think about it, I, I over the years found myself thinking, well, yeah, visualization and meditation are super important. Like I can remember lots of times hanging out with, or, you know, seeing these world champion skydiving teams, best in the world. And this is, you know, 20 years ago in the land in Paris Valley. And they're doing all these things. They're meditating every morning. They're taking time to visualize, you know, you'll see this team and they're getting ready for the next jump and they're just sitting there quietly all together with their eyes closed, 
focusing their breath and visualizing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very interesting when you see people, especially in sports, performing at the highest level, all these new agey things are just like, no, that's how we do it. It, it, it is. And I don't, I don't know if there's a, um, a popular television show right now that I'm catching up on Ted Lasso and I, I'm, I'm not all the way through the season, but they just brought in a um, it's, it's, it's about a football team in London soccer to the Yanks. And they brought in a, a, a new player and he's very ohm and meditating and everything, but, and I'm going like, this is exactly what we do too. <laughs> yeah. And we do in the aircraft at 16,000 feet in formation before you're about to hurdle yourself out of the airplane is we all put our hands together in the airplane and take a deep breath as one focus again and the the calmness it's like a blanket of calmness that comes down over you before you're about to do this incredible type a aggressive thing but that's life as well yeah. And one of the things that I, I, I don't know, I enjoy about skydiving, I think a lot of other people do it, too, is you're in this type A aggressive atmosphere. I mean, you're literally, you're throwing yourself out of an airplane, thousands and thousands of feet above the air. You're going to fall towards the earth at 120 miles an hour, relying on this little wadded up bundle of lines of nylon to save your life. But at the same time, when you learn to do it well, it can be such an incredibly calm experience. You know, while you're getting this big burst of adrenaline surging through your body and yet your mind can be just really calm and focused and enjoying it, which is important too. that, that calm and that focus is incredibly important because, you know, we were talking about this earlier. When you look at these large formations, you're looking at that one little picture or those five seconds of video of this beautiful formation built. But what's happening is you have to get all those people out of these four or five, however many airplanes flying in formation, they have to, to present identify and intercept and all fly together to their spot, hold that formation for a few seconds. And then everyone has to fly away and get into clear space to open their parachute. And that's all happening in 60 to 90 seconds, 60 yep. to 90 seconds. I mean, think about that and think about all those people in the sky doing all that in that short period of time. I mean, I, I can think of how these, these, again, new agey things that we talk about help us focus and concentrate and be focused and calm in, in high stress situations become so important. What else for you has been important in like, uh, what, what are your tricks? Tell us the super secret sauce for staying calm and focused when you're doing these things, Kate. Well, breathing is, is honestly a really important one. Uh, trying to keep, uh, use a term sometimes competition term as arousal level and arousal level is where you are your best set for competition. When I say competition, it could be anything, a jump or anything. And your arousal level is a line. And I'm actually drawing a line, but I realize you guys can't see it. If you're above that, you're over the line. You're jacked up. Your heart rate's way too high. Your breathing's way too high. You're not going to perform at your best. Below that, your heart rate's too low. You're distracted. What am I going to have for dinner? You're letting your mind draw off into different tangents. Uh, my nose itches. Yeah. And you're below the line. And the, one of the tricks is, and I firmly believe this goes for life in general, is skydiving, is to realize your optimum arousal level and know the tricks to either bring yourself up or take yourself down to it. Sometimes, I mean, if you're a caffeine addict, sometimes in, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon, you need that shot of espresso. I'm, my arousal level's too low. I can't function. I'm thinking about it. All I'm thinking about is dinner. Or maybe you need to go out for a walk or take a walk around the office or something. It's too high. I can't focus. My breathing's too high. I'm, I'm getting scattered. I'm, I'm worried. The what ifs are taking over where I'm a firm believer in the what if versus why not, where most people are driven by what if. What if something goes wrong? What if my parachute doesn't open? What if I don't, what if I don't get the promotion? What if, what if, what if? Very misleading. Again, it's subjective because the amount of things that can go wrong are legion. There's absolutely no way to add up all the what ifs in the world. So switch that to why not? Why not be calm? Why not do the best job I am physically and mentally prepared to do 
right now. That might not be the same as an hour from now. It may not be the same as a month from now, but right now, be in the now. Why not take the amount of time to do this job correctly as well as I can? Perfection, again, is it's, it's subjective, but do something right. It's objective. There is only one way Basically, I mean, obviously, there's more ways to do something right, but usually the path is pretty much one way to do something right, whether it's a skydive or a presentation at work or cooking a meal is don't worry about the what ifs and and try to try to switch that mindset to the why not, because it's it's easier to be calm if you tell yourself why not just enjoy it. Why not do the best we can? Why not go for a run and just do two miles today, even though I don't feel like doing it? And, and this is one of the tricks that I use is, uh, is turn the what ifs into why nots. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> that's, that's like super useful. I think it's super powerful because like you were saying, you know, you, you said something really powerful there for a moment. We do focus a lot on, oh, well, this is what happened last week or, oh, you know, I'm not really where I think I want to be. You know, if I just have two more weeks or another month to do this, you know, it'll be better. Or what if things didn't happen last week that happened last week? And instead, if we say, why not? Why not just be here now in the present? Yeah, I really love that. Yeah. Your lizard brain wants you to be safe. So your lizard brain is full of the what ifs. It's easier to cruise at a sea level because you know you can do it. You can do it on autopilot, but why not cruise at a B or A level? Why not go for it? What's the worst that can go wrong? Because your lizard brain, lizard brain is afraid of failure uh, above and all, whether that failure is to your coworkers, to your family, to your skydiving team. You're, you're afraid to fail. And as a result, you tend to make a compromise to be average. And you're cheating yourself. Why not be above average? Why not be awesome? It's a good day to be awesome. I love that. Why not be awesome? It's a good day to be awesome. That's great. Well, Kate, this has been fantastic. And I want to be respectful of your time. I always ask people a question at the end of these episodes. And I'd like to ask you the same question, if you don't mind. What is your dream right now? My dream? Dream. Well, there's just so many. Uh, that's such a subjective thing. Um, uh, oh. I mean, I, I think I am living my dream. I, I'm actually in a really good place in my life. I am. My, my family is amazing. My job is amazing. I'm traveling the world, doing what I love to do. I, I can't imagine things really being much better. So I, I don't, I don't really have a dream right now. I think I wake up and it's it. <laughs> that's great. I think that's a great place to be where you say that you're, you're living it. That's fantastic. Well, Kate, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I think people are going to really enjoy hearing this and enjoy, and, and you're giving people a lot to think about. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Scott. You have a great day. I'm going to include a link in the show notes to a great article about Jump for the Cause, which is the nonprofit organization that Kate helped to create. You'll be able to read about some of the women's world record skydives that they completed. I'll also include a link to a great article from skydivemag.com about the 400-way world record from 2006 that still stands that Kate was a part of. They have some great pictures of the formation itself, 400 people linked together in free fall, and also pictures showing the dirt dives that Kate was talking about, the skydivers lining up to get in their aircraft, the formation building in the air, and the skydivers breaking off and tracking away, flying away from each other so that they can get to clean air to open their parachutes. I'll include a link in the show notes to that article so you can enjoy the pictures and read all about that 400-way world record formation. As always, I'd love for you to visit my website, scottmillercoaching.com, learn about the work that I do as a coach. I love helping leaders and students and other people to use their time wisely to prioritize and focus their attention on what's most important. I also love helping people to get out of their comfort zones in different ways. I'll also invite you to find a way today to flip that switch that Kate was talking about. 
instead of worrying about what might happen, instead of saying, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? Try to find a way today to say, why not? Why not do it? Why not be awesome? And in fact, since today is May the 4th, I will say, instead of trying, do or do not, there is no try. That was for you, Misty. And if you're wondering what my dog Bug is doing, Bug is on the couch relaxing after eating her breakfast. And that's for you, Lauren. Remember to like or subscribe or follow our podcast. Do whatever that button says on your podcast player. And come on back and join us for the next episode. Take care. May the fourth be with you.